Hi everyone, um, welcome to this short session on uh, the top 10 common pitfalls of the CFA um, exam and you know how to study for the exam and how to avoid some of these issues. Um, my name's Tom, Tom Gordon. I'm one of the CFA instructors here at Fitch Learning. Um, I can attest to have gone through all three levels of the CFA examination myself uh, and obviously have the right to um, use the CFA charter. So um, we've got an agenda today which is to kind of highlight some of these te uh, top 10 common pitfalls. Um, just talk about my own experiences and also from, from your perspective um, how you should be studying for CFA exam uh, and also just trying to offer um, some insight into some of the solutions that we have here at Fitch Learning uh, which also includes um, quite a significant um, upgrade in the online platform that we provide for our delegates uh, which is called the, uh, the Cognition Portal. Um, also I know there's a number of people that are potentially live so uh, I, I do have a screen here that people potentially ask me some questions um, and what I'll try to do especially towards the end of this small session um, is to give an opportunity for people to ask questions. You know, I'm always trying to think what people would like to know but feel free to kind of address any questions um, or anything that maybe I haven't covered. Um, then also that what we'll do is provide some next steps that will show you some of the uh, packages that we have here at Fitch Learning whether it be uh, a course, you know, a course uh, classroom that you come in to do or some online portal with the CFA Cognition portal that you may decide to use. So the top 10 common pitfalls. We try to identify, not necessarily in any particular order, but just try to identify some of the key issues that delegates will face when they're studying for their CFA exams. This will be you know, generic sometimes across all three levels. You know, depending upon potentially the, the course content and structure of the examination, some of these points may be a little bit more or less important as you move through to level two uh, versus uh, level three. So what we'll do is we'll address each one of these um, um, points one by one. You can see there the first one identifying around the kind of study hours that you need to commit with regards to the CFA exam, um, trying to construct some sort of study plan. So the kind of first part of there is really trying to identify the kind of structure and the way that you present yeah, your lead up into the examination as to how you will therefore go about your studies. And we'll address some of those issues. Um, then there's also the, the idea that um, you may realize that the CFA syllabus itself is a massive syllabus. It's very difficult to say that I've grasped every single concept of the syllabus. It's more a case of trying to mitigate the fact that you're going to have gaps in your knowledge. Um, and also when you're studying, it's just trying to make sure that you don't focus on the wrong areas and that you're aware about what the examination requires of you in terms of understanding the body of knowledge. Um, then we're going to move into areas to kind of particularly focus on. So for example, the important importance of ethics in the context of the examination and then it kind of moves into the idea that you know there's one thing to know the content but there's also the as important I would say is to make sure that you do the kind of question practice being able to apply the knowledge that you've learnt into a multiple choice environment so therefore it kind of goes around a bit of the exam practice and also the exam technique side of things as you move towards the back end of, uh, of your studies. There's also the actual examination, it, uh, examination day itself, you know, making sure that you understand the logistics of the exam centre, you know what you're going to be presented with in terms of the timings, um, you're going to take lunch on the day, you know, many of the issues that you actually present yourself with on the day itself. And we'll talk about the idea that um, you're taking a mock exam under time conditions before you go into the actual examination is also a, a strong, strong suggestion that you would do that um, leading up to the exam. So let's just start with the first one here. There's a lot, you know, I'll try to address some of the points as we go. The first one we have here is that, um, you know, the, the CF Institute, you know, they're the guys that administer the exam. They will come up with a recommendation as to how many hours you should study for each level of the CF exam that you take. Uh, and the recommendation is, you know, assuming I guess no prior knowledge, is that you're looking at 300 hours of study for level one. So that is something that, you know, when I sat level one, one of these people that make sure that I kind of tick the box is that I was really trying to make sure that I did structure my studies to try and incorporate the potential of having to do 300 hours. And I say potential because it does depend upon your background. That's the whether or not you maybe move through that maybe faster, 
even potentially longer than that 300 hours. But it is kind of key to make sure that you look as to where you're going to start your studies. You know, a lot of people might start to make their attempt to start their studies for the level one exam in December um, in the next kind of few weeks or so, which I think is perfectly reasonable. And you therefore need to kind of sit down and say, well, given the start date that I take, you know, I need to fit in 300 hours between now and then, and that's going to be set to a number of hours per week. You can see there that over a six month period, you took looking at sort of 11 to 12 hours of study each week. Now, that's not necessarily going to be the fact that you just write off one day, you might decide to do that, it's entirely up to you. But, you know, you need to think about your life um, in terms of what, what's going on at work, you know, what's going on at home, do you have any significant events that you might want to try and piece that out and that you don't necessarily just do one whole day block because you're going to find that you'll kind of rapidly um, lose some of the momentum if you're having to sit there for a block of 11 hours in one day to try and do that. So it might be the case that what you decide to do is to kind of break the course up over time. Uh, and of course we produced a new portal and um, you'll see later on that there is a link that you can look at if you want to get an extract and like a demo version of the portal called the uh, cognition portal here at Fitch Learning uh, and one of the key things that we've done during the development of that product is to make sure that what we can do is kind of almost splice up the material into much smaller chunks that allows the user to quite easily step in and also step out of their studies to come back to it at a later date you know over the time that I've been a CFA instructor here at Fitch Learning for the last sort of 12 years, the market has changed quite considerably where a lot of people now are kind of trying to attempt a lot of online learning in a lot more bite-sized form. And that's something that we really listen to uh, in the way that we produce the Cognition Portal. Not only is it the more adaptive, but it's also tried to kind of piece out the, the individual components that gets really into the CFA curriculum to make sure that you understand the detail but also the kind of vast volume that's present in the level one syllabus. So that's going to be key to make sure that you do take a look at the fact that you're looking at 300 hours per level and making sure that you can fit that in. The next thing I guess is, yes I've got 300 hours, um, I'm trying to identify the areas of where I'm going to be stronger, where I'm going to be weaker, but also just coming up with a plan as to where I would start in terms of my studies. Now if you're looking at 300 hours, okay, what it's important to therefore do is not just kind of start the clock, start studying, turn off when it says 300 hours, is but also to kind of structure that in as a robust fashion as possible. So something that we're you know, very keen on here at Fitch Learnings and the structure in particular, you know, people that will be coming onto a course, you know, we will always try to present the course in a way that helps the learner to move through the material in the most efficient way possible. And, and, and from our many years of knowledge, that's not necessarily starting at, let's say, what we call study session one of the CFA syllabus and then going through to you know, study session 18 in order. You know, what we will try to do is to kind of present to you what we think is the most logical order, which, for example, could be starting in the quantitative method section because that really does underpin the entire syllabus in terms of understanding things like financial maths and statistics, then moving into other areas where the application comes in which might be in fixed income, it might be in equity, alternative investments, portfolio management, corporate finance. There is kind of an overlap that quantitative methods does underpin things. So I often kind of suggest to people that a nice intro into the syllabus is through the quantitative methods that often then opens that up. And that's something that we try to reflect on the uh, cognition portal because we try to First of all, number one, you'll get introduction videos, but also the ability to kind of log the date that you decide to start your studies. And then what will happen via a study planner is then present lots of key dates and then suggestion as to what you know, areas you tackle by topic area on each particular date. This will also come with certain milestones surrounding question practice that will be progress tests interwoven into the syllabus and also the final mock exams that you'll use as you get close to the examination itself. Um, of course, people's you know, plans do change. If it's the case that you need to change that start date, then using the CFA portal, the cognition portal, is quite easy to change the, the kind of start date for your studies um, using that system. And that's important that what it's there to do do is to kind of construct a study plan that's going to give you the most efficient use of your time going forward. And that's something that you will find uh, is really important for the 300 hours that you're then going to set down. Now, 
The other area we mentioned in there is that you haven't learned a whole syllabus. Oh, I can relate to that. You know, do I ever feel as though I've gone into the CFA examination thinking, right, ask me anything and I'm going to completely nail it? Probably not, right? You know, to me, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You're trying to make sure that you do have a sufficient coverage of the material, but also to the extent that you're not going to spend sort of three weeks on one niche area that represents a tiny part of the syllabus when you could have been more generalist and, and tackled other areas. So it is really important. Yes, you haven't learned the whole syllabus. You know, it's obviously important not just to counteract and just say, look, I think this will come up in the exam, this will come up in the exam. And just focus on very, very small parts. Okay, you do need to make sure that you, you get a good coverage. And I think there's a kind of a double-edged sword there. It's not so much that you just kind of dedicate your entire life over the next six months towards the CFA um, studies, but it's just trying to make sure that you do get that coverage. Now, I think, you know, um, being involved in the production of the Cognition Portal, I think what was, you know, quite a, a useful exercise, even for me, is to kind of look at all of the learning outcome statements. Now, remember that the learning outcome statements ultimately form the basis of the CFA syllabus are telling you what you need to know for the examination. And, and, and identifying the learning outcome statements themselves and then looking at our question bank, for example, to make sure that we do have coverage of the, all of those LOSs, you know, we can safely say that with the cognition portal and the way that it's been you know, constructed is that we have a vast bank of questions that do cover essentially all the learning outcome statements that are required for the exam. Now that does still kind of bring a tall order for you guys to say that I need to address every single LOS along with the videos and maybe the question content that comes with that. But remember that what we try to do is produce the cognition portal in a way that's more adaptive. And what it's trying to do is to make sure that if you feel or if your results tell us that you're kind of proficient in an area, then it will speed up the process to move you through the syllabus. So it's kind of in important to make sure that using that structured plan making sure that you get the good coverage of the syllabus without getting too in-depth and bogged down in certain areas is going to be kind of key. You know, the learning online tools that we will, will kind of provide you with the Cognition platform certainly enable you to do that in the most efficient means possible. So I thought I'd throw this one in because I think it's often uh, you know, the way that people interpret the issues surrounding ethics um, you know, it does worry people sometimes and a lot of people hear along the grapevine certain rumours um, pertaining to how you study ethics and what you need to achieve in the examination in order to pass the overall exam. So one thing I would say, you know, I, I think about my classroom environment, one of the first things I say on kind of, you know, day one or evening one, whatever it might be, is that ethics is an important part of the exam. You can see up there it says it's the second biggest topic by weight, level one. That represents 15%. You know, at the accounting section, it is another key one which represents a bigger proportion of 15%. You know, you're looking at 20% for the accounts, but the ethics is a big chunk um, for, and it, it is something that you need to make sure that when I come into a classroom environment, I say to people up front, is that what you need to do sooner rather than later is kind of the little and often strategy rather than kind of completely cramming at the end is to make sure that you get a good coverage of studying ethics in kind of bite-sized format over the entire study and plan. It could be that you commute into work on the train or the tube and that you might decide to take a bit of time just to study the ethics. And there's two key areas to that, of course, is number one is the actual you know, um, material that's associated with that and the, the CF Institute Code and Standards um, essentially represent the bulk of the ethics curriculum and that I would always suggest to my delegates that you go and look at the CF Institute's curriculum book directly with regards to ethics to make sure that you understand the standards themselves but importantly is also the application of those standards. Um, in scenario context, you know, what is and is not a violation of the code and standards and you'll find that the CFA curriculum has many, many examples in there that show you good kind of practice and obviously bad practice. So that's something that you need to do in your own time and then facilitate that with a lot of questions. Now I say little and often over the kind of time leading up to the exam with a little kind of week before the exam scenario that maybe you spend a morning, maybe on the Wednesday leading up to the exam, to spend a couple of hours just to refresh yourself with regards to the ethics section, you know, reading a few of the standards, maybe doing a few questions, looking at a couple of scenarios, 
because ethics to a certain extent sometimes you know the, when you've looked at examples kind of does kind of go into the short-term memory banks of the brain that you need to refresh yourself closer to the examination so although you do it little and often you also need to spend a bit of time before the exam just to make sure that you brush up on those areas. Now, the other thing as well is to kind of identify is that if you felt that you were what we call a borderline candidate, so you were close to the pass or fail scenario in the actual examination, CF Institute do say that they will use your score in ethics um, as a determining factor in terms of passing or failing you for that particular sitting. So it's important to realize that, especially if you felt that you're a borderline candidate, by brushing up on your ethics and making sure that you're strong there um, can only be good when it comes to your final assessment in terms of pass or fail. Now that does not necessarily mean that you therefore need to pass the ethics section individually to pass the entire exam. It just means that if you are borderline, they'll use the strength of your ethics score um, as a determining factor. So that's important to make sure that you do um, take a look at the ethics in a piece pro piecewise process um, over your studies. Now, the other part on this is the lack of exam practice, okay? I think there's two bits to this, you know. During your studies, you sit down, you watch a segment of video, you get questions on the CFA Cognition Portal that intersperse that will be there to make sure that you consolidate a lot of the concepts that you're learning in a video format. So we try to take an approach that kind of builds in question practice in between different videos that you look at that gives the coverage of the material, getting to an end of a reading, you know, like a chapter in the CFA syllabus and doing, you know, potentially a knowledge check, you know, a group of questions that will then test your proficiency in your understanding of that particular area. So that's really key that during your studies, it's not just a case of sitting down, writing notes and saying it's all going in. The application needs to come from question practice during your studies um, in, 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 our, in, our, in our portal in an adaptive way. If you're stronger in one area, the system will pick up on that and move you through the material a lot quicker. If it's the case that you're getting questions wrong, your proficiency goes down, it will then suggest that you need to go back and look at the relevant sections, whether it be video content, to help address that situation. So that's going to be key. That then gives you a bit of practice to see the, the styles of questioning and how you can be te um, tested on certain areas. That's one part. We'll see another part later on where it's mentioned as well, but obviously the actual examination itself is two three-hour papers, AM and PM, six hours on a Saturday you know, leading up to the, the holiday season, so in December. So that's important that you also have the actual fatigue of sitting down. So it's really important that you also, as you get closer to the examination itself, start to think about exam technique. Number one, how do you kind of present yourself in the exam in terms of your know, preparation, making sure that you remember all the things that you need to take into the exam hall, but how are you going to tackle the paper itself? And really what's going to be important there is the idea that what you do is you sit down and do a proctored or an invigilated mock leading up to the big day. How do you deal with sitting down for two, three hour papers on a day leading up to the examination? It's not the case that you sit down and say, oh, do you know what I'll do Friday night? I've got two hours. I'll sit down with a glass of wine, do some questions under time conditions. That's a perfect world. I'm saying making sure that your question practice as you lead up to the exam becomes more focused, more structured. You sit down and do big blocks of questions and you make sure that you do sit and mock under time conditions just to see how you deal with any time pressure if that's the case. And that's going to be important as well, of course. Now, moving on to the other bits as well, you know, pacing your studies. You know, we've mentioned kind of earlier on is that, uh, of course, the, the, the portal when you first log on to Cognition will identify the start dates and obviously that's leading up to the examination itself and kind of propose a, a, a natural course of study. You know, life does get in the way, but making sure that you will find that, of course, certain life events might come into it where you need to take a certain break. Are you planning a break? You know, who's to say that you should just do six months straight, flog yourself and completely wipe yourself out leading up to the exam? that the reality is, is that maybe you decide to take a five day break, go and chill out, go on a holiday. That's not gonna be detrimental. You know, sometimes that can be quite nice. 
fact is that you need to make sure that you deal with the pace of your study in a way that's manageable for you. Uh, and obviously, you know, the sooner you start, the better, the less cramming you're going to do, because that's ultimately not going to be the best way to attempt the CFA syllabus, because to me, CFA is all about trying to as much as possible, trying to understand the material um, rather than just completely memorise. If you completely memorise it, you're just going to get a saturation point after kind of day one, and it's just not going to work. So you need to make sure that you do try and plan your studies and certain life events over the period of time that lead up to the exam. And just take that into consideration. That is life at the end of the day. Uh, what else? Oh, the beloved um, BA2 Plus is a key one, right? Now, there are obviously several prescribed calculators of the exam. So essentially you've got the Texas Instruments, and I think the other one is kind of produced by the Hewlett Packard um, company. But ultimately you'll find the majority of people that are tackling the CFA exams will use the Texas Instruments BA2 Plus, either the um, student version, which you can see a picture of there, or this lovely shiny professional version. I think it's a slightly older version, but the, the newer version of this I think is black. But it is important that you do um, eat, work, and sleep with your calculator. A little bit extreme, but you know, making sure that the BO2 Plus is your friend is a key one. Now, I always say to my classes that you might have come out of university through high school, you know, ultimately in love with your Casio because it just looks lovely the way you write things and showing it on the top of the screen to say that you've pressed that is all beautiful. The BO2 Plus is more of a kind of just press me calculator and I'll do it, you know, it's to the point. But the many functions that it does, does ultimately give people a passion for this calculator over the three exams that you sit. So it's important to realise that you do have these functions. It's quite amazing. The number of delegates you'll come across, you know, up to level three, and then just find that some of the basic settings of the calculator they just don't have in place. And they think, well, oh, this is taking me ages to do these calculations, when ultimately you could have either used some shortcuts of the calculator or some functions in the calculator that ultimately would have done it for you. So you will find that we'd have down the bottom here a little link there, but just making sure that what we're going to do is, is go and take a look at that calculator guide if you want to, because it will go on there and show you many of the different functions that the calculator has, whether it be some of the statistics to do standard deviation, um, some of the depreciation function to do your double declining balance depreciation, your amortization function for mortgages, for bond issuance, for lease liabilities. You know, making sure that you know how to use that calculator is really, really kind of key. Number one, it will save you the kind of key memory skills of not having to memorize certain key formulae like standard deviation, but also making sure the speed of how you attempt questions for those calculated questions when they do crop up can be tackled quite efficiently with the calculators. That's important. Obviously, something that we've built into um, the online platform, you know, cognition, is the, is, the, is the use of the calculator. That's really key to make sure that you're efficient in the way that you use it. Okay, what else do we have? You know, follow, uh, it says lack of support from your fellow peers. Okay, that's a bit harsh. You know, your mate says, aha, good luck, you're taking an exam. Um, you know, the case is that you'll find, depending on how you study, you know, whether you study on, on your own in your bedroom, you know, then, then of course you can often seek some sort of study guidance by looking at uh, any platforms online. You know, if you come into an evening class of us or come into a day class, um, you know, you could sit there if you want to in complete silence and just kind of zone in front of the tutor that's in front of you. Um, or you could take the stance of saying, well, I've got people around me and maybe I'll just chat to them and just find out the fellow experiences that you've got because it's important, you know. Yes, the examination is a competitive exam, but there's no point in trying to be competitive with the three or four or potentially four 40 or 50 people that are sat next to you in a classroom environment. Get to know them, you know, get to talk to them, find out how they're studying because you can learn from one another. You know, some of the tips and tricks that people come up with you know, can really sometimes help you kind of get through. You know, just having the kind of you know, camaraderie that you have other people that sat around it is also going to be quite useful. And I also say as well is it's not just those people that are also going through the same process as you. you know, if you could talk to um, your spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend, your parents, brother, sister, whoever it might be. 
you're talking to people that don't necessarily know much about the CFA exam as well can actually be just quite useful as well just to kind of just get a general feeling for the fact that uh, they turn around to say do you know what you need to chill out a bit because you're turning a bit crazy the way that you're studying you need to kind of take st a step back relax a bit because uh, that's important you know sometimes people just need to kind of get a little bit of kind of outside guidance just to kind of say you know, either generically or specifically to the CFA are they pointing themselves in the right direction so it's making sure now of course here at Fitch Learning um, as a CFA instructor you know we're here to, 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 to provide a help desk system on the cognition portal that allow you to kind of send in any questions you've got, number one, regarding the material, but also, you know, we're here to kind of chat to you if it's over a phone call or you know, via email, just to kind of get a grasp of how you're getting all of your studies, any guidance on study tips and so on. We're more than happy to help you, okay, of course. We're here, obviously, to get you through the examination and using the help desk function of the CFA portal will be really important as well. Okay. Um, I mentioned a little bit about uh, this earlier on. It's the idea of cramming, I guess. Um, one thing is that uh, we have, what, six curriculum books, uh, approximately what covers 60 readings at level one. It's over 18 study sessions. Um, you're doing questions and you're just learning and memorizing the answers to those questions. You know, that's just not going to work. You know, I always say to people, you know, I think about the kind of quant methods at level one. You know, I try and go through and explain to people you know, the concept behind as many different formulae as possible so that you ultimately, when you get to it in the exams, almost like you derive the answer yourself just by your general understanding, for example, I don't know, money market yields, the fact that you knew that it's based upon simple um, annualization, the fact that you knew it's 360 days means that what I can then do is just kind of understand what I would need to do on my calculator to work out the money market yield. So sometimes it's really important, and this often comes with doing question practice, you're a bit repetitive strain injury, doing lots of questions, you get a feel for it, and you just know how to attempt certain questions. It's understanding the material, doing the question practice, to consolidate. You're not there just learning. You're not going to just cop out and go, okay, I'll learn that, I'll learn that, I'll learn that. You know, there is the odd equation in there that sometimes you go, do you know what? You know, for me to understand the background behind that formula, I could be spending three weeks. You know, Chebyshev's equality, I know it's one minus one over k squared. Bang, there's your mark. So there are, most of the time, the ability for you to understand the actual formula. There's the odd occasion where sometimes you're going to have to learn it. But it's just trying to make sure that you do um, also understand the concepts behind them because you will also get narrative questions that are not calculations that will test your understanding of whether or not you know because of this going up what will be the impact on this kind of ratio. So it's kind of a mixture of making sure that you know and understand your formulae and also to make sure that you understand the concepts behind it that you get a full understanding. That's just going to be just as important of course is just memorizing for the sake of it. That's, that's the key focus as well for the CFA exam. Now the other one I think I've got on here, I think it's one of the last kind of top tips. I just wanted to try and address each one of them. I know this is quite an intense session, but I just want to try and keep it as short and sweet as possible. There's the actual exam day itself. Now I've talked about this before, you know. I go into the level one exam first, you know, I go, that's my first exam, my first experience of CFA. I go in there and think, God, I'm nervous. All oh my life, I'm going to sit here for the next six hours, two, three hour blocks. I'm going to make sure that I understand um, the material. I'm going to answer the questions. I'm going to be logical. And then you look at question one, you think, oh my life, what, what's happening here? So to me, that, that's, that, there's several areas to this. Is number one, everyone is in the same boat, right? Everyone will be nervous. The fact that you're nervous shouldn't be a detriment that it becomes more detrimental. You know, people start panicking and say, I'm nervous. That means I'm going to be more nervous and even more nervous. And then you have a complete meltdown. You go, I'm nervous, they're nervous. That's fine. It's a competitive exam. Everyone's as nervous. You don't need to get every question right. Okay. So I always say to people, this is like one of the first exams I've ever taken where I come out of it. I think, do you know what? I'm not fully 100% sure how that went. I think the only thing I can ever remember that being the case when I took my driving test. Okay, I'm thinking, well, Jesus, did I drive well? Did I not drive well? Because I wasn't so sure. You know, all through kind of university, all through school, it's kind of like, do you know what? I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. You've got to be careful and expect this might be the first time where, do you know what? This is an exam where you're not too sure how it's going on. 
These are all natural feelings that you'll get on the exam day. There will be some questions you don't know, if not, guess. Okay, worst thing, and again, this is exam technique. If you're not sure, just guess, right? There's no negative marking, don't leave it blank. You leave it blank, that's just crazy, right? So again, a lot of people just say, well, I didn't realize. If you can, okay. Exam technique, making sure that you come into the CFA um, um, test center here to make sure that you go through a mock examination that's invigilated. You will find it's important to do as much question practice leading up to the exam day, which will be in a um, you know exam environment coming in or doing it online. You must sit a mock exam under time conditions before you do it, just to see how you get on with your strategy. Because not always do you start at question number one, you might adopt a strategy to start with the accounting questions or the portfolio management, come back to ethics later on. The paper is grouped into sections that you'll be able to move across different areas quite easily. Okay, um, Test Centre will obviously have lots of rules. Make sure that you follow them. Don't do anything that isn't on that letter, right? It's amazing, right, that I hear you know, where people you know, obviously don't do is what they should do. Follow the rules and you will be fine, okay? Plan your journey. Keep your exam ticket and your passport safe, right? Get an early night the night before. There's no point in you, you know, studying to sort of three o'clock in the morning on the Friday leading up to the exam. You're just gonna wipe yourself out. You're gonna be tired on the exam day itself, so make sure you get a good lead into it by trying to relax a little bit towards the end of Friday so you come into the Saturday exam nice and fresh. Okay, so just a couple of questions here. Um, do you get a lot of extra practice questions in the classroom course compared to the online? Um, I, I guess that's a good question. Um, that was from Emma. So just the key thing, I, I guess, is that it's, um, there's two things, really. Um, everything that we kind of do, I guess, in, in a classroom environment can also be done on the cognition portal. So, for example, uh, a lot of people just like the environment of coming into a classroom environment, whether it be daytime or evenings, and what will happen is you'll sit down and you'll be almost forced to kind of study by the tutor adopting an approach which is to kind of teach you. So because of the time constraints of the actual classes themselves, there's not so much the element of being able to do lots of question practice during class. So what we've done is at the back of the slide packs, you always have questions that will facilitate the material taught in class that you can practice at home. But also, you know, what we do is adopt, a, so for example, a strategy where we might have a 10-day um, course over the period of six months with a two-day review course or revision course bolted onto the end, where that two-day review course is a lot more question practice followed by a debrief with the tutor in class around the content and also the exam technique side of things. Um, all of those things have been put onto the portal as well. With the cognition portal, you have what essentially is the learn phase, where you go through the material, understand the material, and do questions. And then as you get close to the exam, we release a tab on the portal called the um, review phase. Uh, and that's kind of providing a lot more of kind of guided exercises surrounding exam technique, preparation for the exam, um, but also kind of allowing you to do workshops, which are kind of similar to what you do on a two day review course, um, which is centered around a debrief by a tutor, plus the ability to do lots of mock exams, okay? Um, how will I cope with the course if I only have access to the online stuff, right? Um, so I guess there's two things, is that um, if you're doing the online course, then I think you'll be a lot more structured in a way that you can kind of in a piece piecemeal process, you know, a lot of smaller chunks, is you can almost dip in and out of the course on a daily, if by hourly basis, because the portal will always remember where you last went, so that you can kind of pick up, and that will become almost like a linear process of watching videos, interspersed question content, and doing knowledge checks towards the back end. So you'll find that everything that we do in class um, you just get a lot more time to kind of prepare for yourself if you're doing it on an online format yourself. Um, I also believe that uh, with the online system anyway is that uh, we do take uh, one stream of our evening classes that will be kind of um, shown live via a webinar system. So you could, if you wanted to, experience the kind of classroom environment by logging on to those um, sessions that will be shown in your calendar on the online portal. And that's another way where people can potentially um, study by just coming into those two hour blocks. But I think that uh, if you're using the online portal, then essentially you can just do that yourself by using <coughs> the kind of learn phase that you have on the cognition portal itself.
<clears throat> now, just to um, kind of finish off, like I was mentioning there in terms of the classroom course itself, and, and feel free to ask questions as, as they come in, that's, that's perfectly fine. The, the kind of classroom environment that we provide here at Fitch Learning kind of vary. So for example, for level one, um, probably one of our most popular types of course nowadays, given the kind of structure of the market where people are obviously working full time, is you have um, an evening kind of class environment where you've got 20 um, evening classes that generally run from sort of 6 to late 30 in the evening, um, with an additional four evening kind of review course that's towards the end of that course, which is, like I said a second ago, more centered around question practice. There's weekend and daytime classes. So, so the weekends in the daytime are usually centered around what is a 10 day tuition course with two day review course, obviously on the weekend or daytime in two day blocks and also Friday classes where those 12 days in total, that's 10 and two, so 10 day tuition, two day review course, and um, it's spread over a number of months. There is um, an, a crammed intensive version, which is usually a five day course, where we, we kind of go through um, some kind of key areas of the level one. We make an, a, a kind of an assumption that people have done a bit of the study of themselves. They come in and do a five day intensive that kind of leads up to the examination. We have um, classes based in London, the city, and also um, Canary Wharf as well, um, where you always get access to the Fitch Learning Cognition if you take uh, this kind of full classroom course um, environment. There's the online learning via the Cognition portal that we've now developed. Okay, I'll leave a little link up in a second that will kind of give you access to, to learning a demo of that. We also have a lot of revision courses or review courses that uh, are for the fact that you've done some study yourself, you come in and then just do some question practice, a little more centered towards reviewing key areas you lead up to the exam. That's a, a two-day review course, which is basically questions um, and tutor debrief and tuition. The five day intensive course, which is, is pretty much the same as the one above, but it actually sits kind of a few weeks before the exam, um, similar in, in, in kind of structure to the full kind of five day intensive course that you have above. You've got online review courses and online mock exams that will facilitate what we do in class on the online portal itself. And that's going to allow you to be a little more structured sometimes to kind of address certain specific area, areas that you have that might be more generic in the kind of two day review course that we do. Okay, so um, let's have a look here. So we've got um, what is the typical class size and how interactive are the sessions? Um, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's from Mark. That's another good question. Um, I guess it varies. Um, in terms of probably our most popular classes, um, you have, I guess, our evening classes are probably the most popular. Class sizes in there can kind of range. We have a number of streams. You might have something like three different streams. Uh, you'll have class sizes that range from possibly you know, 15 sort of maybe to 20 all the way out to sort of 40 or so um, how interactive do they get well I can't obviously be interactive with each and in, each individual but I will kind of interact with the classroom I'll talk to people and I will get to know you you know so I will always try and and I say first evening it's really important that you kind of break the ice a bit and just talk to one another. You know, I'm not going to kind of get everyone up to kind of do an introduction for five minutes at the start of the evening, but just making sure that you guys talk to one another. And then, you know, I will talk to you guys and that if you want to come and address anything before the class starts because you've got specific issues, if you want to ask class any questions in class, that's, that's fine as well. We generally do sort of five minute breaks, two five minute breaks, or I do two five minute breaks in the evening class where you can come and ask questions as well. Um, but you know, I, I think it's quite personable. You know, I, I feel as though I'm quite personable when I'm actually you know teaching. It's not my style to kind of just kind of put a wall up in front that I build sort of six foot high and then just hide behind. It's making sure that we can get interactive and kind of get to know one another, which I think is sometimes the best way. We're all going through this together, so it's important to get to know one another a little bit. So someone says they've done the CISI um, PCIMs or PCAM as the level six. How does this compare? Uh, uh, that's from Ryan. Well, I, I guess I, I don't know a huge amount about the PCAM. I do know other tutors that teach it. We certainly teach it here. Um, it, it is kind of similar. There is natural overlap. But I've got to remember is that level one and level two, um, the CFA, are standalone in the sense that they are multiple choice exams, A, B or C. Um, level three is the one that gives you a little bit of scope to kind of be um, what we call constructive response type exam where 
you're you're doing a mock examination. Sorry, mock examination, you're doing an examination, which is maybe constructing an investment policy statement um, for a particular client. So I guess that the PCIM does overlap a little bit with the level three, right, um, CFA exam. Um, but I think certainly the level one content in terms of understanding the financial markets, equity, fixed income bit on derivatives, you know, the kind of lots of little bits at level one probably sits quite closely to the PCIM exam. You know, level two, I think the valuation side of the CFA probably jumps up quite a bit. You know, derivatives is quite full on at level two, which I think would probably be more than the PCIM. Uh, and also some of the kind of fixed income and equity valuation you do does step up a bit. So I think there's a lot, probably a lot of overlap with the PCIM with uh, probably level one and also the level three CFA exam where you're doing a little bit more kind of advisory uh, in a kind of constructed response stroke mini essay type um, exam. So that's, that, that's probably the natural um, with the PCIM. Just saying there's other bits there as well. So th these were some of the um, learning options that you do have there, guys. Um, like I did mention before, in terms of the cognition portal, I think you know, one thing I say to people is that if you just go on and play around with it, I know what people are like nowadays is that sometimes I can tell you how to use it you know, minute by minute and go through it, but I think people just jump on there, watch the videos and play around. You'll see, hopefully, there's a kind of a natural flow to the way that it's kind of presented in terms of the structure of the um, CFA syllabus being presented in an online format uh, alongside materials that involves, you know, videos, interspersed with questions, doing knowledge checks to kind of summarize some of the key concepts you learned previous to that. The cognition portal will collate all of the information of your performance to try and give you an understanding of how well you know particular areas. It will summarize your performance in all of those areas. And by the time that you get around to the review phase, what it can then do is kind of present to you um, what are your strong areas, what are your weak areas, um, and then kind of allow you to kind of go through the review phase to almost kind of heal some of those areas that you're not too sure on, followed by getting the kind of um, still the wide breadth of the exam by doing the question practice with the, the mock exams. So, so as I, what I'll do is I'll put up um, this final slide, I think it's too forward, that has on here some next steps. You'll see on here there's a few useful um, URLs that you can take a look at. Uh, of course you've got there, um, if you want to listen to any past delegates in terms of testimonials, then, then fine, you can take a look at that. But little one in here which is um, registering to kind of get an understanding of the cognition portal then feel free to kind of take a look and um, we put on there also that there's a 10 percent discount for um, any information session candidates that book by friday so you know if you want to make use of that then feel free to do so um, i want to try and keep this as short and sweet as possible so i've kind of gone over sort of half an hour or so there but what I'll do now is kind of just look at the screen on the right, my right hand side because I'm getting a few questions that come up on here that if you've got any questions then feel free to kind of fire away now. Okay, so sorry, there, there were just two questions that literally fired in that last second. So it says here, what are, this is, um, what are the benefits of having CFA level one or I guess passing the CFA level one examination? That's a, that's a very good question. I think um, number one, I think one of the key objectives of CFA level one is it kind of gives you good coverage of the financial markets, um, good coverage of the financial products um, in areas in quite an in-depth way, gives you good understanding of the accounting section, um, where it will help people that potentially are um, you know, directly involved in the fund management industry, the kind of buy side industry, kind of research. But increasingly, I do find that a lot of people that come and do level one in particular, maybe just from a, a middle office um, or operations um, background. You know, I get a lot of people that come in from a technology environment. You know, they say that I'm sat there producing trading platforms all day for, for equity, but you know, maybe they don't fundamentally understand how equity work or how fixed income works. And I think coming in to do CFA to a certain extent um, can give you a little bit more of an in-depth knowledge of those products, which will, which will help you. Um, it says the other one here is from Ryan again. It's with regards to PCIM. Um, is the knowledge that mu much harder than PCIM? I'm trying to choose whether to study CFA or not. Um, um, if I'm honest, I think level one to a certain extent probably has a lot more coverage than the PCIM. So there's probably a lot more volume. Um, to a certain extent, it's probably a little bit more complex in area. So for example, I know in particular like fixed income level one is probably a lot more involved. 
Um, but other than that, probably the accounting section is quite a big area. You, know, you do need to know the in-depths of IFRS versus US GAAP, for example. Level two is probably quite a step up again, which probably goes beyond PCIAM. Um, and then level three, I think, then does dovetail with PCIAM a little bit more in the kind of advisory format. So you probably find that level one and level two uh, are probably a little bit more in depth than you've got in some of the PCIM material that you kind of come across. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more generic syllabus as well. It's not necessarily trying to be that specific. So, for example, it's not centered around UK regulation, you know, whereas it's got a global set of ethical standards that are a little bit more kind of um, you know, um, higher level, if, if that makes sense. Other than that, guys, thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Like I said, my name is Tom Gordon. I'm one of the CFA instructors here at Fitch Learning. Um, Maybe I'll see you in, a, in an evening class in a not so distant future in London. You know, I'll say, come and say hello to me. Um, um, other than that, if you're doing it online, then um, I'm sure you'll see me um, in the online videos, either in a younger form or a slightly um, aged um, post-children, post-marathon form. I don't know. Um, but other than that, guys, thanks for taking the time to listen to me, and hopefully I will see you soon. I'll just hang around and see if there's any questions. Um, but other than that, wherever you are in the world, um, enjoy breakfast, um, dinner or um, tea.